We're over in the book of Revelation. And tonight, the Lord willing, we're starting part one of church number seven, the church at Laodicea. What I want to do tonight, this will probably take three sessions on Laodicea. I want to show the connection between the last three churches. The church at Sardis, the church at Philadelphia, and the church at Laodicea. We've seen as we have been going through the seven churches that are listed that there are overlapping things that occur in each one of those churches. Some have good commendations and some have bad statements about them, rebukes from the Lord Jesus Christ. But very interesting interweaving on each of these churches. We've looked at Philadelphia and we'll review some of that tonight, so we'll pick up the key issues that we want to see in Laodicea. So I'm going to go ahead and read the church at Philadelphia in verses 7 through 13 before reading the verses that deal with Laodicea in verses 14 through 22. And to the church, the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I hope thou art cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, as thou mayest see, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Gracious Father, 
Let us have open ears tonight that we might hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, not merely to the church at Laodicea, but to the churches, which means the Spirit is saying it to us at the Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood, New Jersey. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you probably noticed a few things as we were going through those two passages since I gave you a heads up that we would be looking at some parallels that are taking place in these two church letters. The angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. When we look to the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen. Emmet means truth, the, the Amen, from which we get this Amen. Truly, truly, I say unto you, the faithful and true witness. The veracity of the Lord Jesus Christ is emphasized to Philadelphia. It is also emphasized to to Laodicea. I know thy works, verse 8, is the first thing that he says about what he knows about the church of Philadelphia. In 3.15 he says, I know thy works. He's examining the works of each of these two churches. Oh, the works of Philadelphia they didn't have much, but they were doing the best they could. And so Jesus opened the door for them himself. And nobody can shut it. But the works at Laodicea, lukewarm. Neither cold or hot. He's going to spit them out of his mouth. Philadelphia didn't have much. But... Jesus said, I'll keep your door open. They had a lot at Laodicea, just like they did at some of the other churches. Behold, thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And you don't even know how wretched you are. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's going to be a key one in just a few moments. Because he talks not only about buying gold and we talked about some of the other rich churches that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed we've talked about the white raiment too haven't we we talked about that in relation to Sardis we see that again over here in Philadelphia now we see it again over in Laodicea white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest, mightest see we notice the love of Jesus when we looked at the church in Philadelphia. In verse 9 he says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship at thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. We say, well, yeah, sure we can understand why Jesus loved Philadelphia. Do you know that Jesus also loved Laodicea? Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. How could Jesus love Laodicea? And yet it's very clear that he does. And so we see that parallel between Philadelphia and Laodicea also. Back with the church of Philadelphia, we saw a door. I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, has, not, has kept my word, and has not denied my name. We find down here there's also another door in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. We find there's a promise to the overcomer in verse 12 with Philadelphia. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. 
In verse 21, to Laodicea, Laodicea, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set with my father in his throne. Fascinating. One incredibly good church and one pathetic, miserable, stinking, compromising church. Yet we find parallel things that Jesus says to each of those churches as we go through that passage. Now let's take it into a larger overview as we compare it also with the church at Smyrna and see these same things showing up, but a progression as we move through those three churches. Philadelphia, the faithful church, the missionary church. In church history, it appears to be most closely parallel to the time of the Great Awakening through the beginning of the 1960s when the church in America took a definite turn to the church qualities of Laodicea. Only two of the seven churches have no rebuke from Jesus recorded against them, Smyrna and Philadelphia. We saw that as we looked at the chapters in 2 and 3, the character qualities of the Son of Man are reflected from the description of the Son of Man in that Son of Man vision. But when we looked at Philadelphia, it focused on five character qualities of Christ that express his messianic character as described in the prophetic Old Testament. The first character quality that we looked at is he who is holy. That is perhaps the most important key description of God in the Old Testament. The holiness of God gives us the key to the character of God. Holiness which cannot tolerate even the smallest sin. You cannot continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You cannot just make grace the central character quality because grace is always in harmony with the holiness of God. It's the only one of God's character qualities that's repeated in triplicate in Scripture. We talked about that out of Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The character quality that provides the framework for all of God's other character qualities is his holiness. You cannot fully understand any of the other character qualities of God apart from the holiness of God. There are people who call holiness legalism, but when you call holiness legalism, what you're doing is impugning the central character quality by which God has principally revealed himself in the Bible. Holiness is not legalism. Holiness is a reflection of the central controlling character quality of God himself. In other words, if you're reflecting the character qualities of God, you are not a legalist. Holiness deals with moral purity. It deals with separation from all forms and all levels of sin. Without the holiness of God, you could never understand what sin is. Biblically speaking, sin can only be defined as that which stands in contradiction to the holiness of God himself. It is the holiness of God that alone gives us a definition of sin. Otherwise, there would be no absolute standards for determining what sin is and what sin is not. And as I discussed in previous messages, without the holiness of God, we're left with situational ethics. And we'll end as Israel did at the end of the book of Judges, where every man did that which was right in his own eyes, and that's what's happening in America today. God has commanded us to reflect his holy character. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And that's not only in the New Testament, it's quoted by Peter in the New Testament as well. And the entire Bible doctrine of separation is based on the holiness of God. The Holy One of Israel. God's favorite use of that term through the book of Isaiah for himself. Isaiah uses it over 30 times to describe the God of Israel with a focus on his character in contrast to the unholy character of Israel. It's one of the key names of the God in the other Old Testament books. The Holy One of Israel. His holiness is essential to his character, his relationship to Israel. 
We need to understand that because that also sets the stage for why God is not happy with Laodicea. Laodicea was a compromising church. Laodicea was a church that didn't care about holiness. Laodicea was a church that didn't care about truth. We see both those things in those epistles to Philadelphia and into the epistle to Laodicea. But with Laodicea, truth was sort of one of those flexible things that you can push it this way. Well, maybe it means this, or maybe it means that, and we don't have to take too definite a stand on those issues. It's like the compromising church today in relation to creation versus evolution. And so they hold to theistic evolution, a threshold creationism, or all kinds of other weird doctrines that do not fit the text of Scripture. But Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so when we get to Laodicea, we not only have the reflection of holiness coming back from Philadelphia, but Jesus especially emphasizes to Laodicea the issue of truth. With God, there is an absolute standard of truth. He is the true one. He is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Truth is absolute. Laodicea never picked up on that. They trusted Jesus. They were saved. But they obviously weren't Bible students. They obviously hadn't come to the point where they said, Thy word is truth, and no matter what anybody else says, I will stand on the word of God. And they can kill me for it, but I will stand on the word of God. Laodicea hadn't picked that up. And so Jesus has to emphasize in his introduction to the church at Laodicea, there is absolute truth. We talked about the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ being a proof that he is in fact God come in the flesh. He is the Holy One of Israel. The demons recognize that. They said, Thou art the Holy One of God. We see the title, The Holy One, is used to speak of the resurrection of Jesus. Quoting the book of Psalms, we find in Acts 2, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. It's quoted again in Acts chapter 13, 35, Wherefore he saith in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. The Holy One of Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is one of his titles of deity in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the title that's used to bring conviction of sin and call to repentance. It's the title as one of the proofs of Jesus as well as the Father is involved in sending the Holy Spirit. We see that in 1 John 2.20. Horus gives us our tie-in between the faithful few at the church at Sardis and the church at Philadelphia. So this holiness goes from Sardis... It goes to Philadelphia. It comes down to Laodicea. God presents himself this way because he is a God of absolute standards. A God of absolute moral purity. A God who cannot tolerate compromise, which is what he's dealing with at Laodicea. When we began our study of the church of Philadelphia, we saw a key connecting thread with the church at Sardis where Jesus promised to give white robes to the faithful few in contrast to their fa fa fancy, colorful clothing, which was a product of Sardis. We find the white robes again, not just in Sardis, not just in Philadelphia, but we find the white robes again as we look at Laodicea. Do you pick up on the idea that there are certain key themes that Jesus has for every one of the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's for Collingswood too. Holiness. Truth. Separation. Moral purity. Reflection of righteousness. The imputed righteousness of Christ, which is what the white robes speak of. 
as we look through the scripture. Revelation 6, white robes of the garments of martyred Christians. Revelation 7, white robes of the garments of believers from the church age raptured before the great tribulation. Revelation 19, verse 8, explains the symbolism of being clothed in fine linen, white and clean. It's the imputed righteousness of Christ to the believers. That brought us to a study, as you remember, of justification and imputation, two of the key doctrines of Scripture. Justification, you are declared righteous. Imputation, you are made righteous. And when you are made righteous, you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, which is portrayed by the white robes, as we see them in Revelation chapter 19. We saw how it tied into works, not for salvation. We find in the book of Revelation and throughout Scripture that works relate to two things. Number one, the establishment of guilt. Look at the works, guilty. Number two, determination of the levels of punishment or levels of rewards. We'll get to that when we get to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20 talks about there was the great white throne, him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. There was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, both small and great, stand before God. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Nobody gets saved in Revelation 20. There's a judgment of works to determine the level of punishment in hell that they will receive. That's what Revelation 20 is all about. Death and hell were cast into the lake and fire. This is the second death. Right after the phrase, they were judged, every man, according to their works. Nobody's going to heaven at that point. Many other passages. We talked about the judgment of works falling into categories. Four categories, manifestation of those who have saving faith. Believers show it by their works. Number two, manifestation of those who do not have saving faith. Unbelievers never manifest good works according to God's standard. Number three, how God determines, not salvation, but the level of rewards for the believer and how God determines the level of punishment for the pagans. The three areas in which the Christian believers will participate, we talked about that last week, or a week before that, because last week we were uh, celebrating Independence Day. But the three areas in which Christian believers will participate in judging others. There are three areas in which you will judge according to 1 Corinthians. Number one, you'll be judging someday pagans on earth. Number two, you will participate in the judgment of angels. Number three, Paul uses that as the reason why we are supposed to be involved right now in judging sin in the church. Why? We can do it because we have the righteousness of Christ. There are any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that you sh the saints shall judge the world? So there's number one that you're going to judge. You are going to judge the world with Christ. If the world should be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters, that is, in the church? Verse 3, know you not that we shall judge angels? That's the second area where believers will participate in judgment. How much more of the things pertaining to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. And we know he's talking about Christians because it says so in verse 5. Don't you even have one person that shall be able to judge between his brethren? People, you couldn't judge anybody if you didn't have the imputed righteousness of Christ. When people quote the Lord Jesus, who, when he said, judge not lest ye be judged, they're using it usually as an excuse for why you cannot criticize their sin or tell them it's sin or call them to repentance. That's usually why they resist and quote that verse. They don't know anything else about the passage. They don't know the next phrase. But they'll say, oh, the Bible says, judge not that ye be not judged. So quit telling me that it's bad for me to be a homosexual. Quit telling me that it's bad for me to be a transgender. Quit telling me that it's bad to be living in fornication. The next phrase, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, don't be a hypocrite when you judge. It doesn't say never judge, because Paul tells us here that we are supposed to be involved in judgment, and in three areas, in the church, someday we're going to judge angels, someday we're going to judge the world with Christ. We couldn't do it without the imputed righteousness of Christ. 
just don't be a hypocrite when you judge. We saw that white raiment relates to glorification, to holiness, to purity, to spiritual warfare as in Revelation 19. We saw the white raiment of glory at the transfiguration. We saw the white raiment of glory uh, at the resurrection seen by the armed guards. The angelic clothing, the angelic clothing at the resurrection of Christ seen by the women was white raiment. The angelic clothing at the ascension was seen by the apostles. Two men stood by them in white apparel. Clothing connects the last three churches. Today, people don't care what they wear to church. <laughs> but did you know the last three churches? When Jesus wrote to the last three churches, he talked about clothing. At all three churches, he talked about clothing. And they say, well, yeah, yeah, but he was using symbols but to talk about holiness and righteousness. Yes, true. But God never uses a false symbol, something that doesn't occur in reality, something that is a lie to express a truth. When you come before the King of Kings, when you come before the Lord of Glory, when you come into his holy presence, should you dress as though you're going to a beach party? Should you dress as though you were suntanning in your bikini? I think not. The Bible talks about holy festive garments. It was the picture that was given to us of the high priests who came into the temple to worship. Again, white raiment. There were special tassels on the bottom of their robes. There was a special mitre worn by the high priest. Kadesh Yahweh, it said on it. Holiness to the Lord. Holiness. When you come into the presence of the living God. last three churches he talks about clothing rather interesting Sardis there were the white robes for the few Philadelphia holiness portrayed by the white robes in the parallel passages Laodicea they were so bad off they were naked can you imagine coming to church naked pretty gross but he says, you're naked. They desperately needed to be covered by the white robes. Remember verses 17 and 18? Clothing which portrays the spiritual condition of the church is central to the letter given to each of the last three churches. What did Jesus say about Laodicea? Look at verses 17 and 18 again. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You know, they thought they had all the fancy clothing they needed. It's sort of like the story of the emperor's new clothes. How many of you know the story of the emperor's new clothes? There are some who don't know the story of the emperor's new clothes. Where these tailors decided to scam the, the emperor by telling him they could weave such fancy clothing that only people who were ignorant couldn't see the clothing. But everyone who was wise could see the clothing. And so they pretended to weave this clothing out of thin air. And the emperor would come in and look and they'd say, oh, it's about one third of the way done and they're working away at the looms and they're working away with their needles and thread. And You know, he thought to himself, I can't see anything. On the day of the coronation procession came and they carefully put on this invisible clothing. The emperor thought it was invisible. And the emperor got on his horse and began to parade through the streets. And everybody, oh, what beautiful clothing! Because they'd heard that if you couldn't see the clothing, it meant that you were a fool. And so they all didn't want to be called fools. And so they said, oh, it's magnificent. It's glorious. And the emperor was thinking to himself, well, I can't see it. But everybody else seems to be able to see it. So he rode along in pomp and circumstance until a little boy cried out of the clothes and out of the crowd said, Mama, the emperor has no clothes. That's the picture we have here at Laodicea. They thought they had everything. They thought they had the latest designer clothing. But they didn't know that they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. 
So Jesus says, look, let me give you some counsel. He's treating them gently. He actually treats them more gently than he did some of the former churches. When he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. We're going to spend more time on that next week, the Lord willing, but gold tried in the fire. You know what makes gold pure? It's when you apply fire to it. He's saying, you need to go through some persecution. You need to suffer a little bit because it's the suffering that burns out the dross. It burns off the slag. It's the fire that makes the gold run through the cracks of the rock down to the bottom of the kettle where the fire is underneath and the rock from which it came actually floats to the surface because the gold is heavier. And the goldsmith scoops off the slag from the surface and discards it until all he sees in the pot is pure gold. Not one impurity, every one has been removed from the surface. And he can look down into the gold and see himself reflected in the gold. That's what Jesus wants with you and me. To see his image reflected in us. Purified as pure gold. Jesus is saying gently to Laodicea, what you need is some persecution. Buy your pure gold from me. Gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. There's where real riches come. And then he says, what else you need? You need white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. We'll talk about the eye salve a little bit later because Laodicea was known for a very special eye salve. But spiritually they were blind. Remember what we learned when we studied the church of Sardis? A lot of people can be involved in churches and appear to be alive, but they're not going to get white robes signifying righteousness that's been imputed by faith. It was only a few at Sardis which would receive the white robes. And we learned the remnant principle, how God always saves out a remnant everywhere. But when we look at Laodicea, they were all naked. They all needed white robes. There are few who are going to get white robes there at Sardis. But he says to the church at Laodicea, all of you all are naked. I counsel you to get some gold tried by fire that you may be clothed with white raiment that the shame of thy nakedness appear not. Laodicea had a lot of rich people who wore designer clothing. But what they needed was not designer brand clothing. What they needed was the white robes of righteousness. In God's eyes, they were all naked. At least there were a few who had white robes at Sardis. In Laodicea, they were all naked and didn't even know it, and they thought they were a pretty good church. They were the good old neo-evangelical compromising church that didn't hold absolute truth on anything and thought it could be flexible and uh, you know, brought into a whole bunch of new manuscripts and all kinds of new Bible translations so that, uh, hey, we can be up with the times and really communicate with our culture, you know, and do the boogie-woogie up on stage with strobe lights and guitars and all the rest. They didn't even know that they were blind. They didn't know they were naked. They didn't know that they were poor. Do we? Dear people, which church do you think we best reflect? Or what elements of each church do you think we reflect? You know, we talked about that remnant principle. We talked about it out of Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. 
We saw that sometimes the remnant, even as in Elijah's day, is larger than we think, since it's the remnant that's often disconnected by distance and time, so you don't see them all together. But a remnant is there. But remember, as we move toward the end, the tares are going to outnumber the wheat. There's going to come a time of harvest, and there will still be some wheat. But there are going to be a lot of tares. At the time of the Reformation, the Roman Catholic harlot was filthy rich and just as decadent as Sardis. But God had kept a remnant alive, and the living seed broke free and became the Protestant Reformation. That's the spiritual ancestry of this church. But there's always the temptation, always the temptation to go back to the old ways. And Satan will do everything he can to pull you back. This afternoon, we had the privilege of driving Dr. Cho down to that building. It's not a church, that building, where once this church met. A place that God used the ministry of Dr. McIntyre in a very powerful way. Satan couldn't stand it. You know the story. Dr. McIntyre put on trial for rebellion because he would not support apostate missionaries. Defrocked. Final Sunday in the church over there because the denomination sued as the trustees of that property. Dr. McIntyre walked out. 1,100 people followed him. The following week, there were only seven people in that building. And they came to this corner here in an apple orchard, set up a tent, and began this church. But how decadent has it gotten? Today, a female pastor and out in front, right next to the sign, the rainbow flag, signifying their welcoming of the sodomite community. People, God has called us to purity, to holiness, to separation. He's called us to truth because his word is absolute truth. Five commands to the faithful women at Sardis in Philadelphia also apply to the church at Laodicea. Wake up. Strengthen the things that remain. Remember, keep, that is obey, and repent because there is no revival without repentance. There are a lot of parallels between Philadelphia and Laodicea. He who is true, Revelation 3.17. That's the character quality of Christ mentioned to Philadelphia. It's also seen in the letter to the church at Laodicea. 3.14, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The Gospels clearly testify that Jesus is the source of truth, and Jesus said it clearly, and so did the Gospel writers. John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's how John introduces Jesus in John 1, 14. At the incarnation, he is truth. Verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8, 46. Which of you convinceth me of sin? If I say the truth, why do you not believe me? 14, 6. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I'm skipping a lot of verses, by the way. There are a lot more verses on truth just in the Gospel of John. Verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Truth. What do you think the Spirit of truth thinks when you prevaricate, when you lie, when you bend it just a little bit, when you submerge it so that people can't see it, 
when you compromise it or act flexible when it comes to absolute truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. That was John 17, 19. John 18, 37. Pilate therefore saith unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Do you understand how important that is? Because that's in the letter to Philadelphia. That's in the letter to Laodicea. That's one of the focal issues in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And it's something that Philadelphia held to, and it was something that Laodicea had forsaken. One other very interesting parallel and contrast here. The letter to Philadelphia talks about three things. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no man shuts, he who shuts and no man opens. Say, whoa, that's really interesting. Did you know that John, in that verse, Jesus in that verse, because it's Jesus who is speaking, Jesus is quoting Isaiah 22, verse 22. Let me read Isaiah 22, starting in verse 20. Because we find an exact quotation out of the way Jesus presents himself. Isaiah 22, 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with a robe. Ah, suddenly we're back to clothing. Interesting, isn't it? Because that's what we also see here in these three churches, these last three churches. I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle and will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now look at verse 22. Remember, Philadelphia, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no man shuts, he who shuts and no man opens. Look at Isaiah 22. 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Wow. And Jesus quotes that verse and says it applies to him when he writes to Philadelphia. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Suddenly we're moving from a near time prophecy to a long range prophecy. That happens often in the book of Isaiah. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house. The offspring, the issue, all the vessels, a small quantity from vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall. And the burden that was upon it should be cut off. For the Lord has spoken it. The Lord Jesus Christ cut off. For our sins. That's Philadelphia. But the letter to Laodicea also mentions opening a closed door. This time in the context, not of salvation, in the context of fellowship. I know that verse is often quoted in relation to salvation. That's not the context. The context is to people who are already saved. The context is fellowship. You see, the church at Laodicea was out of fellowship. Look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is written to Laodicea. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. We'll eat together. We'll have fellowship together. Jesus is telling Laodicea, you're sloth. Your laziness, the fact that you're neither hot nor cold. Who wants to drink lukewarm water? I don't want to sit down with you and drink lukewarm water. You're not hot, you're not cold. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. But I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. I want to come in and sup with you. 
I want to have fellowship with you. Get hot. Get cold. Do something. Make it clear who you are. What you stand for. Be a refreshment to those who come looking for the good news. Be on fire for Jesus. Hot and cold. It both works when we talk about being in fellowship with Christ. So what was the church at Laodicea like? Our time is up. I can't believe it. But let me give you at least this. So what was the church at Laodicea like? It was very much like the modern compromising neo-evangelical charismatic and praise and worship churches that focus on social justice instead of on separation to the gospel of Christ. Remember we discussed three layers that we see with every one of the seven churches, and I'll close with this. Layer one, each church of the seven churches was a real church that existed at the time John wrote the book of Revelation. The character qualities of each one of these churches is accurate and precise to that particular historic church. Layer two, each type of church described in those seven different churches can be found throughout church history. You'll always be able to find a church like Philadelphia. You'll always be able to find, no matter where you go in church history, you'll always be able to find a church like Ephesus. You'll always be able to find a church like Pergamos. You'll always be able to find a church like Laodicea. You'll always be able to find a church like Smyrna. You'll always be able to find a church like Sardis. So no matter what point of church history you're in, you'll find all of those churches are in those periods and the letters are specifically to them. Layer number three. Every one of those seven churches mentioned in Revelation also appears to parallel the progression of church history as a whole. In other words, Laodicea clearly parallels what we see in the church around the world today, with obvious exceptions. There are other churches, though not the majority, that fit each of the other church types. Because each of those church types exists somewhere in the world. But practically speaking, especially here in America, we live in the lackadaisical, slothful Laodicean period of church history. Christ's invitation to open the door for fellowship indicates that the church at Laodicea was a church of believers, but they were out of fellowship because they were lukewarm. He didn't want to drink the lukewarm water. Those in fellowship became hot for Christ. Those in fellowship became a cool refreshment for other believers seeking fellowship. We're going to talk more about this issue of fellowship as one of the key requirements for the Christian life. Without it, the church will grow lukewarm. We're exhorted to love one another, and we're exhorted to good works. But we'll have to talk about that later. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. And Father, as we look across the country, yes, we can point at others, and we can criticize. We say, oh, they're bad. They're compromisers. They compromise on the inerrancy of Scripture. They compromise on the inspiration of Scripture. They compromise on the preservation of Scripture. They compromise on creation versus evolution. They compromise on separation. They compromise on the way they undress when they come to church. It's easy to point the finger because we are surrounded by Laodicea. But Father, the message is what the Spirit says to the churches. And so the message is also to us. The church at Laodicea is a warning for Bible Presbyterian Church at Collingswood that we never lose our zeal for Christ. We never lose the heated passion that we have for telling others about him. That we never lose the cool refreshment that comes when we share good news with someone who comes to Christ. That we never lose the fellowship that comes when we are in fellowship with him and with one another. 
Father, we pray that you will take the word of God as proclaimed tonight. Remove that which is not important and emphasize to each of our hearts individually what is important for us. That we might apply it and that we might not be like Laodicea, but that we would be hot or cold. That we'd open the door that he could come in and have fellowship with us. And that we'd have fellowship with one another and that this would be a place where those who come to Christ would know that Jesus is Lord, for we pray it in his name. Amen.